Number 10, Soyuz 11. It was April 1971 when the Russians launched the world's first space station. Three cosmonauts aboard said space station. They all spent three weeks observing, conducting experiments, you know, dare I say, normal space station behavior. But their return trip, however, on June 30th, that's when things took a tragic turn. The spacecraft made a normal re-entry and landing, but when the ground team opened the hatch up, all three cosmonauts had suffocated. What happened? Well, it turns out a faulty air vent had opened 30 minutes prior when the descent module set Separated, and the cabin had actually depressurized. From that point on, the Soviet and the US space programs would ensure that their astronauts had to wear spacesuits during any phase of any mission where depressurization could possibly occur, just to be safe. I couldn't imagine how scary that would be. Also, just wear this suit all the time. It looks cool, it looks pretty badass. I'd wear the suit at home, are you kidding me? Make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich wearing that thing. I'd walk all slow too. I'd really do it like I was in space. Number nine, Project 1794. This project was created with the goal to build sort of a saucer type aircraft that would be designed to shoot down Soviet you know, attacks. This program was created in the 1950s and it was quite ambitious. It had some pretty, you know, high goals. Some Tom Cruise-esque goals. If you've seen Top Gun Maverick, here we go. A team of engineers began trying to build a disc-shaped aircraft, but here's the kicker. They wanted it to be capable of traveling at supersonic speeds at high altitudes. They're gonna go fast. The documents about this project show that they wanted it to be able to travel at Mach 4, which is well, four times the speed of sound, and they wanted it to be able to reach an altitude of over 100,000 feet. Yeah, at the time, the project was estimated to cost around $3 million, which is around $26 million today. I acted like I thought of that, but I wrote it down. I couldn't do that math. Are you kidding me? In the end, the project was canceled in 1961 because the craft failed all these tests and proved to be aerodynamically unstable, which of course would provide a whole slew of problems at a high speed, especially supersonic ones. Again, if you've seen Top Gun Maverick, this is a, a waste, a big waste of money. We didn't, we didn't get it with this one. Number eight, too fast. We're at this stage in life now where Teslas are self-driving people to work and I can't do it. I'm a, I'm a 10 and two guy minimum, at least a 10, you know what I mean? You never know what technology might do, what choice it might make for you. Humans are still, you know, better than computers. I don't know, I'm scared. I've, I've watched Black Mirror too many times and it shows. On June 4th, 1996, Europe's Orion 5 rocket launched successfully, but 30 seconds into the flight, the rocket flipped 90 degrees out of nowhere and the onboard computer triggered the self-destruct mechanism just two seconds later, that fast. It just made that call automatically. Instead of a launch where a human would make a call to, you know, maybe self-destruct, this is just the computer making that call. It's not very ideal, that's, that's terrifying. This rocket knew it was going too fast and it just dipped. The investigation revealed that some sort of old code wasn't properly adapted for the new Ariane 5. Old code for the four, into new body equals problems, yeah. In this case, the engineers had decided the specific velocity in question was too high to become a real problem. That was only true for the Ariane 4, so you'll live and you learn. Number seven, a desperate flea. So once this fire began, there was no stopping, right? The fire department, I'll explain more of that in a bit, they couldn't stop this raging fire, nobody could. Citizens fled and ran down to the Thames River and their goal was to escape the smoke and chaos by boat, hopefully. Now a few Londoners were brave and they stuck around. A handful of citizens assisted local soldiers Soldiers, carrying buckets of water, splashing water on anything and everything. They were doing anything they could, but ultimately they were ordered to leave as the flames would burn on for days longer. Number six, stopping the blaze. This blaze was so bright you could see it from 30 miles away, okay? It was horrible, but it was quite the spectacle. It took days to get this under control, and the way they did so was by purposely igniting buildings that had gunpowder in their storage on fire. Yeah, the reaction caused the building to, of course, blow to smithereens, meaning that there's now nowhere else for said fire to travel. Yeah, let's stop this fire by igniting a few controlled fires. Sounds bad on paper, but it was the only solution available at the time. And we still do this today, to a degree. You know, we don't blow up any buildings, but we're like, eh, we'll just cut off this crop right here. Number five. Fake news. The amount of questions that were pouring in after this, I mean, how did this happen? Who started the fire? What do we do now? Are we all What's happening? Desperate souls were seeking answers. Now in the following years, around the 1670s, a monument column was put up near the blaze's origin. We believe it was designed by architect Robert Hooke, but some cases source Christopher Wren. Now it's important to note their names or include them because on this actual column, over 200 feet tall, full of engravings and sculptures, all that good historic stuff, Stuff. On this column, it told the story of what went wrong that fateful day. And it wasn't exactly accurate now, was it? The fire was due to the hand of God, a great wind, and a very dry season. Yeah, that's it, just bad luck, I guess. An inscription on the monument has thankfully been removed since 1830, but it actually blamed the disaster on the treachery and malice of the Popish faction. 
Yeah, you did this. He's like, well, I was asleep, what? Cut to 1986, a little further away, London's baker finally took the blame and apologized to the Lord Mayor for setting fire to the city. Yeah, a little late, but we'll all accept it, thank you. Members of the worshipful company of bakers gathered on Pudding Lane. They unveiled a plaque to Thomas Fariner. And it was the, he was guilty of causing the Great Fire of 1666. Yeah, it wasn't a great wind, it wasn't the hand of God. It was Thomas. Let's all get it straight. Number four. Damage control. In total, the fire took out 13,000 houses, 90 churches, and most famously, the old St. Paul's Cathedral was destroyed. The people that did escape with only a few belongings, well, now they were homeless. It was horrible. It's estimated that 100,000 people were just left on the streets. King Charles II acted quickly. He was dead set on rebuilding, of course, after this point, right away. And that's when the legendary architect, Sir Christopher Wren, entered the picture. He designed a new St. Paul's Cathedral with dozens of smaller churches spaced around it in order to prevent future fires. That was the goal here. That's the city that we now recognize today. It was the result of a massive hazard, right? We're looking at a big safety map. We don't even realize it. Now we look back after this tragedy and the following houses were made of brick or stone or, you know, something. Something better than tar and wood, you know what I mean? And London's streets became even wider to prevent spread of a further flame. Even so, fire departments weren't actually active until the 18th century, which is still wild. Number three, Phobos One. It was 1998, and we'll look over to the Soviet Union for this one. Back in 98, they launched the Phobos One spacecraft to study Mars' moons and even possibly land a probe on Phobos, the largest moon of them all. On September 2nd, 1998, mission operators lost contact with the spacecraft and they never heard back after. Yeah, just ghosted them and then drifted away into space. How rude, right? So what went wrong? What went awry, if I may? Well, software uploaded on August 29th, well, it turns out somebody missed a single character. Again, a little tiny error caused a <laughs> The biggest problem. This put the spacecraft into a steering test mode for some reason, which also deactivated the spacecraft's thrusters, so eventually it ran out of battery power and communication, and now it's just floating off into nothing. Just doesn't even do anything. Number two, space workout gone wrong. Again, another new fear, I guess. Look, zero gravity, I can't imagine how hard it is to stay in shape while you're floating on the ISS. It's always funny to watch astronauts return, you know, they're all like sea legs, because they haven't been able to do a squat in so long. They haven't needed to actually bend over to do anything. No gravity. But it's vital for that return trip later that they're, you know, in shape. So they work out in zero gravity, but it has its dangers. In 1995, astronaut Norman Thagard was working out, getting his lunar leg day in doing some knee bends, but while doing so, one of the straps snapped off his foot and flew upwards, hitting him right in the eye. Gravity or not, that's gonna suck. That's gonna leave a mark. Thagard had trouble looking at light from that point on, which when you're in space and you're an astronaut is really not ideal. Steroid eye drops healed Thagard's eye ultimately, but yeah, could have been a lot worse. Imagine losing an eye in space. You know who lost an eye in space? Thor. It's pretty bad. And finally, number one, the Challenger disaster. There's a series on Netflix about this entire situation I implore you to watch. It's hard to watch, but way more informative that I can be in, you know, 45 seconds. On January 28th, 1986, barely a minute after the space shuttle lifted off, a malfunction in the spacecraft rubber seals that separates its rocket boosters, it caused a fire. And from that point on, everything happened so fast. The blaze spread up the rocket itself and the disaster sadly led to the deaths of all the astronauts on board, including a teacher, Krista McAuliffe. Now with it being minus three degrees Celsius outside, the engineering predicted some sort of failure, but NASA had already delayed this launch multiple times. So they wanted to press on and launch anyways. The disaster resulted in the temporary suspension of the space shuttle program. So let's hope we learned some things. Again, watch the Netflix series, much more informative than I can be in this video. Coming in at number 10, we have Aleppo. The 1138 Aleppo earthquake was one of the deadliest earthquakes in history. Its name was taken from the city of Aleppo in North Syria, where the most devastation occurred. The quake happened on October 11th, 1138, just one day after a smaller quake the day before like back-to-back -back violence. Due to the amount of earthquakes, the reputation of this blow is seen as the third deadliest quake ever. It took around 250,000 lives with a seismic magnitude scale of 7.1. The region sits on a triple junction between the Arabian, African, and Eurasian tectonic plates, which makes this place one of the most active in the world. Just three different plates stuffed beside each other like a long backseat drive. Just move, you move. Mom, move. Get out, get out of the way. Number nine, Antioch. The Antioch earthquake occurred on December 13th, 115 AD, with an estimated magnitude of 7.5 on the surface wave magnitude scale. Antioch and surrounding areas were devastated with an absolute nightmare when the violent shakes triggered a local tsunami that damaged half the seashelf. 
gnarly. Antioch at the time crowded with soldiers and civilians from all around the world. Whole trees were thrown up into the air, huge structures collapsed, massive numbers of people perished from debris or even being trapped. The aftershocks followed the days and even continued to wreak havoc. Antioch was beautiful. These were Greek and Roman designers. It was nicknamed the Cradle of Christianity from its longevity until then and the role it played in the emergence of both the Hellenistic Judaism and early Christianity. Toll of destruction is about quarter million gone. All those beautiful structures too. 50 years sanding a Corinthian column for four seconds of rubble. That would be heartbreaking. There it goes, huh? Number 8. The First Plague Yersinia Pestis The Plague of Justinian, or the Justianic Plague, 541 to 549 AD. This was the first major outbreak plague pandemic. Fun fact, this is the same stuff that came back for the Black Death. The first old world pandemic of plagues. The OG. The disease decimated the entire Mediterranean basin, Europe, the East, and the Byzantine Empire, just named after Justin I, who, according to historians, got the disease and then beat it during its peak nastiness. Guy got it and toughed it out. Nothing's tougher than a leader just like taping it up, you know? Just band aiding it. This thing was nasty. It killed about a fifth of the imperial population. It spread all through Europe, Egypt, and the Mediterranean. Huge part in the fall of the Roman Empire. Unfortunately, back then, no masks yet. No plague doctors, just neighbors coughing nonstop and a lot of anxiety. Number seven, 2001 Genesis. I've personally never been skydiving before and I don't think I could ever. My friends are talking about it right now and I'm very quiet in that group chat, you know what I mean? I'm absent. Because I'm so worried about the parachute not working. I mean, that's obvious, but it's a very real problem. And one will sometimes see in NASA projects. So, you know, sometimes it goes to shit, even when it's NASA. NASA's Genesis spacecraft launched in 2001, but it's 2004 when it later faced issues. See, when the solar wind sample carrying probe was descended back into our home base, the parachute never deployed. It just crashed down. Remaining samples were all contaminated by the desert air. Other samples were just destroyed on impact Obviously, it was a huge mess. NASA's failure report later on in 2009 revealed that manufacturers had incorrectly installed the probe's accelerometers into an inverted position. So the spacecraft thought it was going up when really it was going down. That's a big yikes. That's a big smash. It took five years to get answers. So I'm sure the parachute industry was low for five years because they're like, uh, what happened over there? Number five, Mariner 1. July 22nd, 1962, an Atlas rocket launch was successful. Now at first, NASA's Mariner 1 spacecraft had hoped to be the first to fly by Venus and get ahead of the Soviet Union in the, you know, the big bad space race, right? Everyone wanted to be the first to launch and leave for some reason. After launch, it didn't take long for operations to go south. The rocket was unable to steer itself and it was heading towards a crash rather than, you know, the cosmos. There's two things that could happen here. The rocket either lands into North Atlantic shipping lanes or it lands in into inhabited areas, which is a no-go. It's kind of a lose-lose. There's no choice other than to self-destruct. Now, humans made this call a little bit better than a computer just deciding to blow up, but humans made the $720 million decision and it came splashing down minutes later. Turns out this was all caused because one programmer left a hyphen out of an equation. Yeah, a little hyphen. I forget commas here all the time, but you know, no tragedy ensues. Number four, the second shortest spacewalk. Luca Parmitano, an Italian astronaut with the European Space Agency, faced what's possibly my new worst fear. I don't know, this is like a premise of a horror movie. This is terrible. It was July 16th, 2013. During a spacewalk on the 36th expedition to the ISS, Luca's helmet began to fill with liquid. Not even water, but it was liquid coolant, so you can't even drink it, worst case Ontario. Water would be bad, coolant, that's... That's just a nightmare, that's, a, that's double the nightmare now. But being in space, that's a bit, you know, that's triple the nightmare. It's no gravity, it's flying around. The spacewalk actually continued for an hour before Luca was able to get back into the ISS and actually free of his suit of doom. He was fine, but this accident could have been a lot, a lot worse. The second shortest spacewalk in the station's history. Yeah, more than fair. I would have tried to have been the first. That's so scary. What have nightmares about that. Number three. Genesis. Speaking of waves and great bands, the great Genesis flood narrative, chapters six to nine, the book of Genesis, good stuff, speaks of the universal flood myth, God's decision to return the universe to its pre-creation state of watery chaos and remake it through the biology and evolution of Noah's Ark. You know the story, we know this. You know, the zebras and lions and stuff. Composed somewhere around the fourth century, the global flood is supposedly a myth, or is it? 
The Younger Dryas Flood Theory or the Late Glacial Interstadial suggests that there may have actually been a sudden flood caused by an impact of some sort, resulting in the Earth experiencing a tidal wave of the century. An impact event presumed to have occurred in North America about 13,000 years ago. Huh. Although young in theory, and still being dissected by scientists today, the Younger Dryas impact theory gives way to literally every culture's telling of a celestial flood rebirthing the planet. What do you think? Arctic animals found in the rainforest, jungle cats found in the ice. Something's fishy here. Number two, Vesuvius. In the autumn of 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius violently spewed a deadly cloud of superheated rock and gas into the sky 33 kilometers high at 1.5 million tons per second, releasing 100,000 times the thermal energy of the atomic weapons of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A key part to the fall of the Roman Empire, cities were obliterated and buried under ash and rock, famously remembered being Pompeii and Herculaneum. Now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, Vesuvius National Park left behind archaeologists a gold mine. The cities were never rebuilt and almost completely forgotten about until the 18th century, where the two long lost cities were rediscovered and excavated. There's still got to be more cities just laying there undiscovered, right? Atlantis? Where's that at? Number 1. Shaanxi Okay, this last one I'm cheating a little bit with the time period, but I think it deserves the respect due to the destruction alone. The 1556 Shaanxi earthquake occurred in the middle of the night January 23rd, 1556 in Shaanxi, China during the Ming Dynasty. Most of the residents that lived there lived in Yao Dongs, which were mostly underground and low access caves carved out of the rock and mountains. With the city sleeping in the middle of the night, the Earth's most devastating earthquake was just brewing. The magnitude of the quake was approximately 8 to 8.3. Yeah, that's massive. An absolutely huge 8.3 tremor. We still don't know how many exactly, but somewhere between 100,000 and a million lives were lost from the eruption, the climate, the famine, and the tsunamis it brought with it. Yeah, this is literally the worst of the worst. Number 10, let's start out setting the scene. So rather than rank the least to worst aspects of this year, let's set the scene of how this became the worst year. Prior to 536, the early 500s were in some pretty heavy transitions. The Western Roman Empire had fallen to German invaders, and the Eastern sect would soon follow suit. The Middle East was divided between the Byzantine and the Persian empires. China's influence continued to spread through East Asia, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam, even though it was experiencing a weak point. China was divided into to both North and South territories and they were constantly at odds with each other. Africa, however, was developing trade routes through the Sahara and a powerful new kingdom was arising in Ethiopia. They wouldn't be heavily affected by this, but part of them would be. Peasants throughout Europe were used to the tradition of harvest seasons being reliable until one day all this movement and all this growth stopped. Number 9. The Mist A mysterious mist rolled in over Europe, clouding the sky in darkness. With the mist, a century of darkness would fall. Literally sounds like the setting of a Stephen King novel. Byzantine historian Procopius wrote about a portent that took place that year and said this, and I quote, for the sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon during this whole year, and it seemed exceedingly like the sun in eclipse. For the beams it shed were not clear, nor such as it accustomed to shed. And from the time when this thing happened, men were free neither from war, nor pestilence, nor any other thing leading to death. The sun was eclipsed for 18 months. For three hours in the morning it would give light, but a light that resembled neither day nor night." Unquote. Other sources describe a cloud or dust veil that darkened the sky. Now, why did this happen? Here we are at number 8, eruption. Now, what on earth could have caused such a mysterious cloud of depression to seize the land? Well, after centuries of mystery, scientists have finally discovered what happened. It was a massive volcanic eruption that took place in Iceland. A professor of medieval history at Harvard University, Michael McCormick, led a study of a Swiss glacier which led to the discovery. Evidence of volcanic matter in the glacier proved that it was indeed a massive eruption that caused it. The ash from the eruption likely led to a fog that caused an 18 month period of darkness. It was so vast it spread across all of Europe, the Middle East and portions of Asia. Number 7. Damgan Earthquake The 856 Damgan Earthquake occurred on December 22nd, 856. The quake had an estimated magnitude of 7.9 
and the maximum intensity of X on the Mercalli scale. Ooh, we're climbing, it's getting up there. The mesoseismal area was about 350 kilometers along the southeast Alborz Mountains, which is modern day Iran. It caused around 200,000 deaths and is listed by the USGS as the sixth deadliest earthquake in recorded history. I'm not gonna lie, earthquakes are my new unlocked fear. It's no longer spiders, spiders are out of the question, it's earthquakes. Holy shoot, dude, these are like the worst of the worst. So unnecessarily loud too? Like on average, it's about 60 seconds of violent shaking and debris. Every year there's about one of these in size, somewhere around the world. Every year, so incredibly loud. Number six, the Mayan drought. Between 760 and 930 AD, millions of Maya disappeared from the earth. No, no, it wasn't all the impossibly carved astronaut pictures and knowledge of our entire solar system. <laughs> But somehow, something huge had wiped out the entire population. Due to its geography and lush environment, scientists have been scratching their heads for millennia. But recent LIDAR and thermal scans have concluded that it may have been nothing at all. Literally, a giant nothing. Or a drought. Yeah, it just dried up. Like my mouth right now. Sorry, I'm gonna get a drink after this. Scientists noticed changes in the environment in which the Maya lived, and the ice core evidence from Greenland indicates that around the time of the Maya collapse, a long-term drought appeared roughly from 760 to 930 in the Kariako Basin. Bullseye. Dude, they gotta worry about aliens, floods, and drying up at the same time? I'm officially done complaining about the subway system. No, I'm serious, I'm done. Number five, Minoan eruption. The Minoan eruption was an abysmal volcanic eruption that devastated the Aegean islands of Thera aka Santorini, around 1600 BCE. It destroyed the Minoan settlements, communities, and agricultural areas on almost every nearby island. The eruption was one of the largest volcanic events on Earth in human history. Tephra, which is airborne pyroclastic material ejected during a volcanic eruption, gives us clues about the exact date and has been aggressively debated amongst archaeologists and volcanoologists for decades. Plumes of volcanic lightning blacked out the skies that led to a number of blacked out summers resulting in just one long freezing volcanic winter. Yikes! Canadians are like, yeah, I don't get it. It's like January. Number four. Crete 365. Sounds like a sick techno band, doesn't it? Crete in 365 was a terrifying sight. The underwater earthquake, which is believed to have been a magnitude eight or higher, destroyed nearly every town, city, and settlement in the eastern and southern Mediterranean, spanning from Greece to Africa and even Spain. Mother Crete. Yeah, this was a big one. Archaeologists have conducted numerous excavations that prove that most towns and cities in the area were destroyed around the time of the earthquake, which has likely occurred the morning of July 21st, 365. Geologists and seismologists believe that the center eye of the quake was off the coast of Crete, hence the name, and studies have shown that may have been the result of a reaction of all the tectonic plates at the same time. Dude, this is like Transformers stuff. The horrifying part was the tsunami. Just a skyscraper high in every direction. Yeah, you know surfers are listening to this right now are like, just saying, man, I coulda. You know what I mean? I'm just saying I coulda, man. I really coulda, you know? Number three, snow in China. China, on the other hand, was freaking the heck out. It snowed in the summer. In the summer! I cannot imagine like a more depressing thing to happen, okay? I like I really can't. I mean, I remember one time in May, it snowed after like two weeks of just like beautiful weather and it snowed again after the longest winter. It was the most depressing moment of my life. Anyways, in some parts of China, the weather was so bad that 70 to 80 percent of the population starved to death. So on top of the famine, it was the weather and all this stuff. Despite this event though, South China seemingly remained peaceful and prosperous under the Liang Dynasty, which lasted from 502 to 49. However, economic pressures and internal strife within the Northern Wei Empire continued to cause trouble. The Northern Zhao was finally defeated in 581, and the South asserted control over the North. This led to the final linking of North and South China when Emperor Wen began construction of a canal system connecting the two parts of China together. Number two, economic downturn. So obviously, with the fact that agricultural production was way, way down, workers were dying left, right, and center, an economic downturn soon followed the wave of plague and the mist. As previously mentioned, rulers such as Justinian raised taxes like crazy, burying his empire in debt. But just how bad did it get? 
Well, the study of seeds found in excavations tell a pretty bleak story. They found a high number of grape seeds in the ancient trash mound. So, what does that matter? Well, by going through each seed individually, that's dedication. They noticed a steep rise in the amount they found, and then all of a sudden, a steep decline of grape pips. The Byzantine Empire, for instance, was pretty well known for the sweet wine that they sold, and they had connections with other like parts of Europe that they sold it to, which means the steep decline in the seeds indicates that their economic ties took a huge hit. And last but not least, let's let's tie this whole thing together with survival. So how in the heck did we survive this thing? It was one foul hit after another. Bad weather, famine, plague, economic downturn, war, people being the worst. Well, a lot of it just had to play out on its own. The plague eventually died down, the planet started to slowly warm up, and along with those changes, the economy started to recover, though it would take over a century for it to actually be effective again. In the mid 7th century, Europeans began melting silver from lead ore, which led to the merchant class for the first time. This was a huge step. The Byzantines dedicated themselves to the preservation of history, and even though Justinian was the worst financially at the time, the critical reform he made regarding the legal system and those pesky construction projects set them on the right path for the future. Number 10, fire starter. Okay, what in the blazes happened? How does such a tragedy unfold in the first place? Let's start there, shall we? Well, it was a Sunday for starters. It was the 2nd of September in 1666. This was, of course, a long, long time ago, and even today it's hard to pinpoint what can cause a wildfire. Today, it's more often than not gender reveal parties. That's the culprit for wildfires. But historians believe the great fire of 1666 started with a baker's oven. Yeah, specifically the baker of King Charles II, but we didn't know that for a while. I'll get to that later on. This blaze all began near London Bridge on Pudding Lane. So British, the most British sentence I've ever said in my entire life. But it didn't take long to spread. That's the thing about these wildfires. They, uh, they don't like stopping and they love wind. Number nine, old houses. Okay, we're talking about medieval London here, right? This is 1666, the time where every house in the city was constructed of old oak or timber. It was gross, right? It was all woody. <laughs> it was just woody stuff. But to add more history to the mix, these houses often had walls covered in tar. Yeah, tar in order to keep the rain out. Now that worked, but in doing so, the fire spread a lot easier. Yeah, it was a little bit messier. Streets were narrow, houses were huddled up close to one another, and firefighters were not a thing, really, at the time at all. I mean, compared to what we have now, not even close. Citizens were told to always check for dangers in their homes, but one baker, he forgot to look. Number eight the first victim. Miraculously, only six people died in the Great Fire of 1666. That's amazing. I mean, obviously it's horrible, of course, and that's still a great loss of life, but this fire destroyed four-fifths of London, yet somehow the death toll was below 10 people. That's wild. I don't want to put the blame on one person here, but we kind of have to. Yeah, one baker left the oven ablaze, and his name was Thomas Fariner. And as I mentioned earlier, he was the king's baker. Sometime around midnight, only a couple hours after he went to bed, these hot embers ignited firewood lying next to the oven. He didn't check thoroughly enough and then the rest is history. Now, Fariner thankfully managed to escape with his family as well as a servant. They all escaped through a window at the top floor, but the baker's assistant was sadly the first victim. Number seven, climate impact. This period of ominous and unexplained darkness led to serious negative transformations. A Roman politician by the name of Cassiodorus wrote that the sun looks bluish and that the moon had no luster. The seasons also seemed to be jumbled together into one. No summer, no spring, just a long, ever gloomy, middle winter kind of thing. Another eerie fact he added was, and I quote, we marvel to see no shadows of our bodies at noon, unquote. The dark sunless days brought periods of cold with temperatures falling as low as 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius all year round, making it the coldest decade in the past 2300 years. This is the closest the world got to the winter depicted in Game of Thrones, besides the actual ice age, of course. This was called the mini antique ice age. Number six, starvation. But with the extreme cold, lack of sunlight, and seasons, crop failure destroyed many lives. Farmers no longer could look forward to a bountiful harvest in the fall as basically nothing survived. The Irish chronicles show that they had a failure of bread, bread of all things, from the years 536 to 539. Europe, parts of Asia, and the Middle East experienced a massive famine crisis. When did things get back to normal? Well, it took over a century for things to really start to turn back. Eventually, Grit fell from the sky and slightly warm.
warmer temperatures returned, allowing for some crops to return. But the people had no way of knowing when that was going to happen. They just had to keep slugging along every day watching their friends and families slowly die of starvation. Not a good time to be alive. Number 5, <laughs> the plague of Justinian. But things weren't about to get any better anytime soon. It wasn't just crop failure and famine they had to worry about. Soon the bubonic plague was upon them. A couple years later in 541 the bubonic plague swept across Europe adding more woe to misery. It became known as the plague of Justinian as it swept through the Roman port of Pelusium, Egypt causing the deaths of half the eastern Roman empire's population. This in turn according to once again Michael McCormick sped up the final demise of the once great empire. The plague struck Asia, North Africa, Arabia, and Europe, taking the lives of a colossal 30 to 50 million people. And now there weren't that many people back then, so this would have really, really made a dent. The same disease would return centuries later and would be known as the Black Death. The reason it was called the Plague of Justinian this time around was due to the poor response from the Byzantine ruler. He was unable to complete the projects he had started due to the farmers and workers dying by the thousands, so he decided to raise taxes and change the tax code. He not only demanded taxes from the people still alive, but demanded they pay the ones owed by their fallen neighbors as well. So not a good time. Number 4, some benefits. There were some. Now, though scientists like to say this is the worst time to be alive in history, it depends where you were and it depends where you live. I mean, I keep thinking that maybe World War II was probably worse or World War I, I just don't know. But it was just such a long extended period of time. If you lived in the Arabian Peninsula, however, you may have actually been kind of grateful for it, you know? Due to the catastrophe, their weather changed for the good. They actually experienced more rainfall. This helped their crop and vegetation thrive. They had so much left over, they could give more to their camels. As a result, they were able to build larger camel herds to help facilitate transport for Arab armies aiding in conquests during that century. It also may have influenced agricultural development in Estonia with their production of rye. In Finland, hunting and fishing were their main sources of livelihood, so the lack of land production didn't really bother them. They were like, okay, cool, I've got this uh, reindeer. Number three, backup plans. So what if this happened again? We need to prepare, right? This almost ruined London. Well, this was a business opportunity as well, right? Of course. Insurance companies hit the market. Hey, if another blaze takes out four fifths of your land, you're gonna need a couple bucks, right? Yeah, come buy some insurance. We got your back. That was the commercial, you know? It's on a wagon. Hey, we got your back. It's easy. Is that a little gecko insurance guy? It's just like a little knight. You could hire your own fire brigade in case shit goes south. Nicholas Barbin created London's first insurance company, appropriately named the Fire Office. Other companies followed, and by 1690, one in ten houses in London had insurance. We love a good business structure, post-apocalyptic biblical blaze. Keep it up, guys. Number two, nursery rhymes. Just like any other major event in history, you gotta make a song about it, right? Or at least include it in a verse or two. We love historical references, especially with a sick beat. Awesome, cool. Now, Jay-Z hasn't mentioned the Great Fire of 1666. Not yet, or at least not to my knowledge. But there is a popular nursery rhyme about it called London's Burning. It's a pretty on-the-nose title for a nursery rhyme surrounding a great tragedy, but okay. The Clash as well, they have songs referencing London's downfall, and there's even a TV show called London's Burning, and it centers around firefighters in London. It's a pretty good one. I saw a clip and I was like, eh, this is pretty intense. It's good stuff. And finally, number one, Nostradamus predictions. Yeah, who knew we were warned about this great blaze the entire time? Nostradamus, the Bible, everyone's calling this Many religions have influenced the public belief of the end of the world, and this one's from all the way back before the 1600s. Now in the Bible, it references the number 666 as the number of the beast. So many Christians in Europe back in the 1600s, they believed that the world was going to end sometime around 1666. And then this happens, they're like, uh, is this it? What the Fast forward to that year, September of 1666, the Great Fire of London actually happened. So many saw this as the prophecy of the end of the world coming true. I mean, of course, thousands of people fleeing to the river with their belongings, what else does that look like? On the bright side of all this, pun not intended, with all the property damage here, the death toll for this Great Fire was only six people. It wasn't exactly the end of the world, but it was for those six, sadly. And this happened on the year of the beast. Coincidence, or did the Bible actually predict the blaze? Maybe the baker started the blaze on purpose because he's a, I need to go to sleep. I can't go down that road. Yeah.